Hey, everybody, how you doing? Teching here, but, uh, shh, keep that on the down low, okay? I'm secret agent undercover teching right now because I got a top hat on. And as we all know, if you wear a top hat, you're a secret agent automatically. Abraham Lincoln, totally a secret agent. Rob Lucci, absolutely a secret agent. Those are the only two pieces of evidence I need to prove this fact, okay? Now, Barry, listen, I, I got you covered this time, buddy, but next time you got to bring your own hat, okay? All right, there we go. Secret agent undercover Barry. And while we're at it, Sabo, is he a secret agent? Yeah, he pretty much is. I mean, he really is. He's just a secret agent for the Revolutionary Army rather than the world government. But we're not talking about that today. Today we are talking about CP9, Cypher Pole Number 9, the main antagonist of the Ennies Lobby arc. Some fan favorites. People really like that group, CP9. And, you know, I think they're part of what made Ennies Lobby so great. Ennies Lobby is considered by many to be, um, in some people's minds, the best One Piece arc, period. And the Cypher Pole made that really possible, okay? So we're going to talk about them today, all the members of Cypher Pole 9, all nine of them, because yes, if, you know, the, the main force that you see right here, those were the main threats against the Straw Hats, but if you include Nero, does anybody remember Nero? Please tell me somebody at least remembers Nero, okay? If you include Nero and... Spawned them, I guess, then yes, you do get nine members to CP9, so we'll just include that there. Um, I did do a video about the Cypher Poles about two years ago, but that was more like an in-general thing about the entire organization. Um, obviously, as you could figure, there's Cypher Pole 9, which is the main enemy during Annie's Lobby, which would lead you to believe there's also a Cypher Pole 1 through 8. And that is the case, it's just that we don't focus on them too much. How it basically works is just a really big recap here of that video. Cypher Poles 1 through 8 are essentially the equivalent of, like, the CIA in our world, if you're from the United States. Um, you know, we as the citizens know they exist. The people in the One Piece world know Cypher Poles 1 through 8 exist. And they're basically just going around the world and, you know, making sure that nobody talks bad about the government. Everything's on the up and up there. And if they hear any dissent from any of the kingdoms, that's when they, they bring down the hammer. Cypher Pole 9 is the secret organization that even the citizens don't know exists, but you totally know it exists. You know, you don't know what it's called necessarily, but you know there's like a secret, secret, deep cover organization that the government's operating somewhere, right? So anyway, that's what Cypher Pole 9 is, okay? And they're going out, they do the real, like I said, like the deep cover stuff, where that operation at Water 7 took like four years of undercover operation, where Lucci and Kaku and Califa and Bluino seeped into the city, and, you know, they got jobs at, like, Galila, and Bluino started working at a bar, and Califa was a sexy secretary for Iceberg, the mayor of the city, just trying to find the blueprints for, uh, blueprints for Pluton, okay? So that was, like, a really uh, important operation there. And then finally, after the time skip, we learn about Cypher Pole Aegis Zero, which I honestly would figure maybe the citizens of the One Piece world would know that that exists. It's just they probably don't see them very often because the main goal of Aegis Zero, Aegis just meaning shield, is to protect the Tenryubito, be like their personal bodyguards and carry out their orders and make sure they're not harmed in any way. So I imagine the citizens know at least of their existence, but Cypher Pole 9, that was like the shadowy organization one. And to be fair, Cypher Pole 9, as it currently stands, in the One Piece world in the present, um, it's kind of defunct. It's defunct because, not because the uh, members have all died, well, Nero kind of did, you know, uh, although, hey, you never know with Oda. Nero might pop up again, and he might, yeah, okay, so, you know, hold on to that. We'll get to Nero. But aside from Nero, none of the other members have died or anything. They've just kind of been promoted to another branch. In the case with Spondum, Luchi, and Kaku, they are all currently members of Aegis Zero. Now, I'm going to assume the other members of CP9, like Bluino, Fukuro, Califa, they've also been promoted to Cypher Pole Aegis Zero. Even though we don't know that for certain, uh, we did find out in one of the most recent and Vivra cards in the data book about the Cypher Pole agents that over the time skip, all of them, everyone except for Spondum, has learned observation and armament hockey. Okay? Now you figure, you know, like, why would they need to learn that kind of hockey if they weren't still assassins, if they weren't still working for the government? Granted, at the end of the uh, CP9's independent report, the cover story they had, it seemed like they were going out and making their own way in the world. They were. It, it seemed like that, that impression, like they were kind of done with the world government, kind of done with taking orders, and they were going to do their own thing. And then you cut to two years later, and they're working directly for the Tenryubito, which seems kind of interesting. So I think the world government realized how dangerous it would be for these people just to be running around the world doing what they ever wanted, they wanted to do. So the world government offered them some sort of reward or some sort of like exchange you know hey 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 tell you what if you come back to us 
and you listen to orders and you work under the tenor you veto as cipher pull i just zero agents will give you a little something in return so something definitely happened that i would be interested in knowing about how they went from the end of the independent report kind of setting out on their own to being literal government dogs working for the tenor you veto after the time skip something's interesting something's up there with lucci it kind of made sense because lucci doesn't really care about the world government lucci just likes to assassin people <laughs> he just likes to ass assassinate people that's how he wants to do okay so he's just like as long as he gets a free pass to do that he's pretty much set hattori is of course just filled with nothing but bloodlust but as for the other members i would like to see where that goes all right so we're gonna talk about every single one here all nine of them um considering we already made a whole video about luchi last year um i'm not really going to talk about him very much so instead i thought hey let's do this in reverse let's go through the dorky the power levels starting from the lowest working our way up to the highest which is luchi's so um the dorky is oda his little foray into power levels like from Dragon Ball or you know Nanatsu no Taizai I guess that came later he doesn't really stick with the power level concept after any's lobby but it is something that existed during that arc okay so let's start with the one that ranked the lowest Spandom Spandom Spam let's talk about Spam no it's, it's Spandom but yeah he's a doofus okay so anyway it's funny because his Doruki his power level is nine Nine. Keep in mind, all the other members of Cypherpool are easily in the triple, possibly four-digit numbers, but the funny thing is that a normal armed soldier, somebody that doesn't know hockey, doesn't know Rokushiki, doesn't have a devil fruit power, just a regular marine that's been trained up in the traditional, like, boot camp kind of way, you know, it's like, okay, soldier, salute, and here, have a rifle, you know, that guy's Doroki is on average going to be a 10 Spondum is even weaker than a regular soldier, okay? So yeah, now it stands to reason because of that pitiful Doraki, Spondum doesn't take to the front lines very much. He's not a fighter. He is very much the commanding officer of the Cypher Pole, which kind of leads into the whole thing of like you have a team of really badass assassins that could literally kill this guy in 16 different ways before he hits the floor. And he's the one in charge of these people. It's like, oh yeah, that's a great motivation to go into work every day, right? Okay, but it doesn't really matter too much that he's physically frail because he does have a, a cool devil fruit sword called Funk Freed. It's a uh, sword that ate the Zozonomi, the elephant, elephant fruit. And he had this elephant with him ever since he was a little kid. So they're like really good companions. And so Funk Freed will listen to whatever Spondum tells him to do. And also Spondum feeds him and takes care of him and everything. So... You know, whenever, uh, you know, he pulls out his sword and he, you know, shoots it at an enemy, it'll basically listen to whatever he says. So that's how he usually, you know, uh, gets through battles, okay? And, you know, if you just get separated from the sword or if Funk Freed gets intimidated like Frankie, Frankie pa takes out his weapons left and points it right at Funk Freed's face and just like, you really want to try this elephant? And Funk Freed, being a smart elephant, is like, no Frankie's like good boy okay yeah and then they just take out Spondum after that so yeah but it, it's an interesting sword it's an interesting ability if nothing else um after the events of Eni's lobby Spondum was kind of beat up a little bit he was slapped the crap out of by Robin which oh my god that was such a cathartic thing to watch right at the end of Eni's lobby when after you know he, she's like you know, Robin's all chained up with the sea prism she can't use her devil fruit and Spondum's just carrying her around like come on get up here we're going to the execution site come on dragging her up the stairs knocking her down hitting her taking out the sword hitting her with that she's on the ground Robin literally holding onto the stairs with her teeth you know there, she's bleeding trying to just stay with her friends trying to get out of there trying to escape this new lease on life after all of that said and done finally after she gets freed first thing she does <sighs> slap and then these hands just appear next to Spondum, and then it just, it goes on for like two minutes, where she's just slapping the ever-loving crap out of this guy. Um, and I think she does it again before they leave, too. She gets one more attack in on Spondum. So, he ends up in the hospital after the events of Eni's Lobby. Uh, eventually, Spondine, his father, who is the original, um, kind of commanding officer of CP9, back during the O'Hara incident, he shows up, and it's like Spondum and Spondine are gonna plan something nefarious, like father and son, 
Khan. Meanwhile, at the end of in the, at the end of the uh, independent report, Lucci takes the arrest of the members of Cypherpol and kind of leaves. So we didn't know really what was up with that. But after the time skip, we see Spondum as a new member of Aegis Zero working under Lucci. So I'm assuming he, you know Spondine used his connections to get his son into that position of power. Okay, because even you know even as an underling, he's still a member of Aegis Zero, which Spondum doesn't deserve that title at all. Um, he's definitely not worth it. So they used probably his position of power there. He's like, hey, can you give my son a position in Aegis Zero? And Spondine was a much more effective commander, at least, than Spondum was, right? Um, still as much of a bastard, but just a more effective commander there. But I think Lucci at least enjoys it that he gets the boss around Spondum now, because back when it was, like, in Eddie's lobby, Lucci had to technically listen to everything Spondum did, even though he kind of, like, stretched it a little bit there. Like, Lucci, how come Straw Hat Luffy's following us? He's like, oh, well, you didn't tell me to block that door or whatever, you know, just like he's waiting for the battle with Luffy. So that's what Lucci really cares about at the end of the day, just satisfying his, uh, his thirst. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, Spondum's a doofus. We all know that. So let's move on to some more impressive members of CP9, like Nero. Yes, Nero, buddy. I'm waiting for his return. Hey, listen, if that mountain god that Odin sliced horizontally in half could, could survive that encounter, Nero could still be alive to this day. And I'm waiting for the return of the sea weasel all right so we don't actually know nero's doriki because he wasn't around whenever frukuro did the the the, uh, the contest power okay so we don't actually know how strong uh, nero was however it stands to reason that he's somewhere between spondum and the remaining members of cp9 number one because it was stated he was a newer member he just kind of like a new recruit that just joined up you know right during that operation with the sea train and number two he only knew four out of the six powers whereas all the other members of CP9, except for Spondum, of course, at least knew all six of them on at least a, a decent level, okay? Um, Doroki, keep in mind that number 10, if you have a 10 Doroki, that's like you're a regular armed soldier, as I said, and if you're Doroki number 500, you are considered superhuman. Like, a Doroki of 500 is the lowest you can have and still considered superhuman. So even though we don't know Nero's Doroki, I would probably put him somewhere around 500, or if it's not at 500, it's really close to that. It's like getting to the point of superhuman capabilities, maybe like 480, 490, but I would put Nero right around 500, 510, somewhere in that range, okay? So Nero was guarding one of the cars, uh, you know, for the sea train when they were escorting Rob into Eni's lobby. He was smart enough to figure out, hey, there's people that are causing, you know, ruckus in these other cars that are fighting their way through, what happens if they just decide to go up on the roof of the sea train and just walk over to the car where Nico Robin's in? Nero was at least smart enough to figure, like, that's a really glaring oversight. So Nero just jumped up on the roof of the cars and just waited for someone to try that. Frankie did try that. He's like, ah, you, you didn't think it would be this easy, did you? Well, today you clash blades with me, sea weasel Nero. So, yeah. Now, I like this fight, but I think the reason why I like this fight was mainly just because we got to see more Frankie. Frankie action than anything. We, we got to see Frankie spitting nails. We got the uh, a marvelous hentai transformation that was Frankie Centaur. So I think that's the main reason I love this fight. But Nero was pretty clever with it too. You know what I like about Nero? He gives me the impression of like if you were actually learning superpowers, but you weren't quite there yet, you're learning how to compensate, you know, for your weaknesses. So Nero could not use the Shigon, the finger pistol technique, or the Tekai iron body technique. Okay, so he mostly relied on Soru, Geppo, Kamie, and the Rock Ronkyaku technique. Those were like his Tempest Kick was like his main way of offensive maneuvering. Okay, but he used those techniques rather well. And you know, for his shortcomings with the finger pistol, he just kept regular pistols on him at all times to use in place of that. So you know, it's not that he was necessarily like a loser or something like freaking Nero. I mean, in the larger concept, he was. But it's just like he was learning. He was still in school. He was, this was like a, this was like a student internship project for Nero. It's just like, so you want to be a secret agent, huh? Okay, well, intern with CP9 for two months, and then we'll see where that goes from there. Maybe we have a standard position for you after that. He was just in the process of learning, guys. So anyway, yeah, uh, Frankie managed to hold him down with his mighty centaur legs and then just punched him straight through the freaking um, sea train car. He lands there. He tries to escape when Lucci was like, oh, you are a failure. Nero's like, ee! And he tries to run away, but um, Lucci just kind of... Yeah, so, yeah, Nero is most likely dead, but you never know! He could show back up. You know what? Honestly, 
Oda, if you just want to reveal all the members of Aegis Zero at once, because I feel like there's a lot more members than we haven't seen. Usually when we see Aegis Zero, it's like, you know, maybe a group of like three to five to six people. We don't get to see that many at once. But think about how many Tenryubito there are. There's a lot of families of Tenryubito. You'd figure there'd have to be like a specific group of Aegis Zero agents that bodyguard each individual family. So there's probably a lot more than what we've seen so far, right? So if you just want to throw Nero in there, like in a random background shot, like, oh yeah, Nero's an Aegis Zero agent. You know what, Oda? No questions asked. I'm perfectly fine with that, all right? But he needs to fix his hair. Good lord, he needs to fix his hair. Okay, all right, so that's enough of the, uh, let's be honest here, like, honorary members of CP9. They're, they're the members that were there just so we could get to nine members, okay? Beyond that, let's move on to the actual threatening group now, starting off with the lowest Dora key out of that group, Khalifa, the sexy soap lady with a Dora key of 630. I should also reveal in this video, I'm also going to give you another tutorial on the Roku Shiki techniques. I know I did that video about two years ago talking about them, but I think it's, uh, I've improved my Roku Shiki technique a little bit, so I'll reveal that throughout this video. Whew, okay, hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome back to another tutorial on the Roku Shiki techniques, and my god, it's uh, a lot cooler out here than I originally figured to do this. Okay, so let's start by doing some Soru exercises. Okay, so we gotta get limbered up. Don't forget to get limbered up. Okay, now, better pay, pay, pay attention. This is gonna go by fast. All right, here we go. Soru! Whew! <laughs> I told you, told you, you gotta pay attention. All right, so let's move on. What's next? So, um, yes, Khalifa actually really cool because she's from a long line of assassins, kind of like Killua from like Hunter Hunter or something, except she's a sexy soap lady. Um, her dad, Lashki, also a member of CP back in the day, still is a member, so she is, you know, grown to be basically an assassin at a young age. What actually happened with a lot of the CP agents is they were just orphans, just kids on like the random street corners that the government ended up finding and recruiting in, brought them to an island, trained them up to become superhumans and members of the cypher pole. That's basically how they recruit. They find orphans and they bring them in. If they show promise, they teach them. If not, well, I don't think I need to really go into detail of probably what the world government does if they're not really satisfied with their investment, if you know what I mean. But Khalifa is from a long line of assassins, so she was raised for this, okay? Which sucks because she has the lowest Dora key out of the main group there, okay? Um, keep in mind also, uh, when we first get introduced to the CP9, uh, they are not a group that's really a Devil Fruit powerhouse. A lot of the groups up until this point in the story, like Baroque Works, like every member of Baroque Works, all the major members had Devil Fruit powers, like Mr. Zero, Miss All Sunday, Mr. One, Mr. Two, Mr. Three, uh, Mr. Five had one. You know, they all had Devil Fruit powers. When we first get introduced to the CP9, the original nine members I talked about uh, before Khalifa and Kaku got their powers you only had three you had uh, Luchi, you had Bluno, and you had Jabra were the only members of CP9 that had Devil Fruit abilities, um, and the rest were just normal assassins. Of course, during the uh, during the course of Eni's Lobby, Khalifa and Kaku consumed their Devil Fruits. Kaku got the Ushi Ushi no Mi model Giraffe, and Khalifa got the Awa Awa no Mi, or the Soap Soap Fruit, uh, respectively, and so they got their abilities there. Um, also, I, you know, just because they got their powers, like, literally right before they fought the Straw Hats, that shows tremendous tremendous uh, room for improvement, right? Like, literally, Kaku ate his fruit, like, an hour before he fought Zoro, okay? The fact that he knew how to go into, like, his cube form and everything, and do his little, like, leg wiggle and shoot the Ronkyakus up into the air and have him fall down, that showed just ingenuity that, you know, he was an assassin all of his life. Can you imagine if that he gave, like, a whole day to practice with his fruit, or a week, or a month, or, say, two years, which is what he's had? Same thing with Khalifa right now. All of their Dora keys, I imagine, are quite quite higher than they were back then as well. So who knows? Maybe Khalifa edges out some other members right now. But yeah, they've had two years to not only practice their hockey abilities, they all have, you know, she has observation and armament. It was confirmed in the Vivra card, but she also had two years to practice her Awa Awa no Mi. Um, so yeah, Khalifa though, I mean, she's the sexy female. Sorry, sexual harassment, I know. Um, her, her bust size is 93 centimeters. Oda revealed that in a Vivra card as well. That was very important to know. Um, but no, yeah, she uses her sex appeal to fight. I mean, when you're, you're Khalifa, I mean, why wouldn't you, right? So, you know, with Sanji, it was easy as hell. I mean, when Sanji walks in, he's like, all right, give me that key! And Khalifa's there, sipping tea. Also, keep in mind, she's an intelligence operative. I'm pretty sure she could figure out, like, yeah, as soon as Sanji walked in, she's like, hmm, yeah, I know this kind of guy. I know how this is going to go. And it went pretty much exactly how she figured. Um, not helping the fact that because of Sanji's upbringing by Zeph, 
he can't bring himself to kick a woman. So Califa manages to handily defeat him, you know, pretty pretty easily, knock him over, turn him into a little soapy doll, and then Nami took up the uh, the mantle from there. Now, before she got her devil fruit, and, and something she didn't really use all that much in her fight with Nami, which I find was kind of disappointing, she had like this spiky rose whip, like something Karama would use from Yu Yu Hakusho. She used that as her primary weapon during Water 7. She used it to grab the edges of the sea train when Frankie ripped them apart to drag them back together, or she's the one that latched onto them. I think Bluno was the one that dragged it back, right? But we didn't really get to see her use this spiky thorn whip at all in her fight with Sanji or in her fight with Nami. It's just like, um, oh yeah, a, a, a weapon that I have been training in for literally years for assassination techniques or using devil fruit powers, which I, ju I just literally got like an hour and a half ago. Yeah, I guess I'll just use my devil fruit powers because sexy soap lady, I guess. Whatever. I mean, she used them really well. She turned her body into a bar of soap to block a lightning strike, okay? Pretty impressive, if I do say so myself. But anyway, I'm going on and on about Califa. Something I wanted to bring up here is also the uh, Rokushiki techniques they preferred to use. They all, all of them at this point know all six, but some of them have more preferences. With Califa, I saw that she used her Shigon and her Geppo a lot. She really preferred the really quick and simple, like, Shigon technique. So, um, yeah, I'm going to show you my new and improved Shigon technique right here. Okay, so next up, I was going to teach you the uh, Shigon or the finger pistol techniques. Unfortunately, with YouTube's new, you know, terms of service and the policies and everything coming down the pipeline, I'm not even legally allowed to use the word pistol anymore, really, so I could get in trouble for that. So instead of the finger pistol technique, I'll show you the finger peanut technique. Finger peanut. Finger peanut. Finger peanut. Finger peanut. Finger peanut. That's how you do it. All right, so moving up the list here with a Dora key of 800, we got Fukuro, who's an owl. Probably most of you probably noticed, but all the members of CP9, whether or not they have zones or not, resemble animals in some way. So, Nero is the sea weasel, Califa is a sheep, uh, and Fukuro is an owl. He doesn't have the owl fruit, he's just an owl, alright? I love Fukuro, okay? He's such a goofy dude. Just look at him. Just look at the guy's design and just try not to laugh, alright? He's got a zipper for a mouth, his whole body is just round, he makes little owl faces like... Um, he has that laughter style, which is just cha pa 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 cha pa 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 which sounds annoying the first 300 times you hear it, but after a while, I was just kind of used to it, honestly, right? Also, he fought Frankie, and I'm noticing that everybody that fights Frankie, Frankie's, like, superness kind of rubs off on them a little bit, so I like the characters that he's beating up, too, all right? I love that fight because Fukuro was chasing him around in the, in the tower, and he was trying to find the cola, and he had that whole scene with Chopper giving him, like, vegetable juice and tea. It's like, I can't run on damn tea. Come on, give me some coal up in here. So Frankie finally gets that and he goes all power and like super and he just starts beating the other crap out of Fukuro, right? So Fukuro is actually the whole point of this Doraki system. He has an ability called Tewaze or Tewas, Tewas Contest. The name of the uh, English translation of that ability is Contest, where because he's shaped like a ball, literally the other members of CP9 just kick him around like a beach ball and after this kicking is done he's not injured he can actually determine based on the power of their kicks what their doraki is it's also important to mention that doraki only measures your physical strength of course just that honestly just the strength of your kick so how powerful your kick is that's what your doraki is okay it doesn't rank hockey or devil fruit abilities or anything else beyond just your physical strength okay but yeah doraki of 800 not bad at all um his ability that he seemed to be used at least the most during his fight with Frankie was the Geppo technique, his moonwalk or his moonstep, because Frankie was like holding on to him and they were about to go over the falls of Eni's lobby, so he had to use that like one foot Geppo to try to get himself off the edge. And as soon as they were over land again, that's when Frankie, you know, busted out his coup de vent and blasted him into a hole right into the ground, taking out Fukuro for the arc. Um, he was also the one that first appeared at the beginning of uh, when the Straw Hats got into the Tower of Law, like, ah ha, cha pa 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 pa, there's the keys that you have to find. Or your princess is in another castle. He was like the tutorial NPC. He was like, all right, well, you've broken into the main enemy's hideout. Time to tell him. I'm, I'm here to tell you what you need to do. You need to find a certain key. Not going to tell you which one it is. Certain members of Cypherpole have the keys. 
have fun. And then he just bounces away like the little owl ball that he is. But I, I like Fukuro. He's a lot of fun, all right? Um, let's see. So, Geppo. I'll, sh I'll show you my new and improved Geppo technique. All right, this next one I got to apologize a little bit. Last time when I did this, I didn't really show you the Geppo or the moonwalk technique because I felt like it was so simple, but a lot of people were confused, so I'll show you. Okay, this is what's going to happen, all right? As soon as I'm done with this explanation, <laughs> it's really cold out here. <laughs> as soon as I'm done with this explanation, I will step right here above the ground, about this position right here, around that. I'm not exact. I'm not going to do a minute calculation, but it'll be right around here, and I will jump up into the air. There will no be, there not be any tricks or anything about it. It will just happen, all right? Okay, let's do this. Who? Keppo. Moving on to Kumadori with the Doru key of 810. Whoa! Okay, so obviously he takes a lot of inspiration from Japanese kabuki. He really enunciates everything he says. Barry, you will fight me in pitched combat. It's a lot of fun, honestly. Okay, seriously, stop this video right now. Well, not yet, because you won't hear my explanation. All right, listen to my explanation, then stop this video, okay? Here's what you do. If you're living with somebody right now, could be your mom, your dad, your grandparents, aunt, uncle, brother, sister. If there's anybody, if you're watching this at work right now on your break, or if you're at school right now, I don't care. Here's what you do. You go up to somebody and you just talk like Kumadori. Say like a normal thing like, Hello there, Adam! How is the weather today? Would you like to go to the movies tonight? Just do that for me, please. That would just make me feel so, so happy going to bed tonight. Just knowing that I did that. Ask, ask somebody out like that. Hey, you never know. It might actually work, okay? If nothing else, they might just feel so sorry for you, they might say yes. So go up to somebody and be like, Hello there! Would you like to get some coffee after work today? And I mean, like, if someone came up to you and said that, what's the only response you could have? It'd be like, well, aside from just running away, it would be like, sure, yeah, that's totally legit, right? So pause this video here and go and do that, but okay. Now, Kumadori. Here's a fun fact. Kumadori's not his first name. That's actually his family name. His mother is an assassin as well, so he also kind of comes from a very long line of overly dramatic assassins, okay? So a little bit little bit more of like a uh, like a flamboyant version of the Zoltic family, kind of, okay? But no, yeah, Kumadori's great. I love him. He represents the lion or maybe the octopus because he's got his hair that kind of moves around with his um, his life return technique, kind of a special version of biofeedback that he has. Um, it might be related to the Kamie, the paper body technique, because Luchi was able to use this technique as well in his fight with Luffy, and it was like an extension of Kamie for him. So for that reason, I'm going to say Kamie is Kumadori's preference there. Um, but yeah, very overly dramatic kind of guy, constantly going on about how his mother is dead and he has to avenge her memory, even though his mother is perfectly fine and well, and he knows it as well. It's just like, he he, he goes overly dramatic with everything. That's why we like Kumadori. A um, lot of really funny scenes, also some slight tentacle hentai-ish scenes with Nami there, but also funny scenes, like when Chopper locks him in into the fridge and he comes out he's all fat after eating all the um, all, all the gorgonzola cheese in the fridge he comes out super fat but it's okay for kumadori because he could just use his life return ability to digest all the food instantly and then return himself to normal or he can make his body thinner fatter you know shorter taller all that kind of stuff we also got to see it with luchi later on that life return ability chopper being a doctor hyposited that was similar to like biofeedback he was able to use his power in some way in that regard, okay? Certainly a very interesting ability. We don't get to see that often in One Piece. Um, the Sanderzonia sisters, uh, not Sanders, the Boa siblings, Sanderzonia and Marigold, um, they were able to use their hair when fighting against Luffy and Amazon Lily, so maybe that's something related to the life return. We see it every now and then. It's just like, is that something that's related to life return or is that a devil fruit thing? We don't really know with that. Um, 
But yeah, certainly a very interesting character. I would love to see Kumadori again. Just, I'm sure Oda would love to draw and write for Kumadori again. All right, he's a really fun guy. Um, he was defeated by Chopper, and he probably got it worst out of all of the members of CP9. Uh, maybe only closely being edged out by Luchi himself. I mean, yeah, Fukuro got coup de vent blasted into the side of a wall. Um, Khalifa got electrocuted. F um, what, what happened with, uh, oh, Bluno got, you know, beaten out by Jet Luffy. Um, but no, freaking Kumadori, he had to face off against pre-time skip monster point chopper. He had no chance, all right? And Monster Point Chopper shows up, and he tries to fight against it. It's like it's like trying to beat down a brick wall. No offense, Barry. Trying to beat down a brick wall with, like, a toothpick. He has this big staff he uses. He's trying to attack Chopper's Monster Point with it. It's just boing, boing, bouncing off of him. And all Monster Point Chopper has to do at this point is... Oh, wait, no! And then just throws him, like, three miles away outside the window at, like, Mach 1. And just flies and just slams into the freaking town and just conked out for the rest of the arc. I mean, yeah, Lucci got the jet gatling at the end of it, so I'm assuming that's worse. But, man, I really felt for... That was one of those fights where I felt really bad for Chopper because Chopper was getting the ever-loving shit beat out of him in that fight. Like, it was very clear that Kumadori was... I mean, Chopper got a few hits out on him, but it was very clear Kumadori was strong. Longer. He had more endurance. Even Chopper's strongest arm point technique wasn't enough to bring Kumadori down. Kumadori being overly dramatic, he kind of wrapped, you know, Chopper up in his hair and he was about to, like, finish him off. And he's like, Ooh, you must not feel pain. I will end your life quickly. Song of the Willow! And he's about to just break it right through, and then Chopper eats the rumble ball and goes monster point. But yeah, Kumadori, really theatrical kind of guy, fits perfectly in the aesthetic, the overall tone of One Piece. So yeah, I really hope they bring Kumadori back. Okay. All right, here we go with some uh, Kamie, some paper body action. Oh yes, this one's really easy. All you gotta do is just move. Move with the pole. Oh yes, just check that out. Oh yeah, check this out, yeah. Moving with the pole here. Feel your body just flow. Flow. Hi, Mrs. Hill. How are you doing? All right, so moving up to Blue and O with a Doraki of 820. Uh, I hope you've noticed that Fukuro, Kumadori, and Blue and o all have about the same Doraki at around 800. Kumadori's was 810, Blue and O's is 820, and, um, oh, Fukuro's was 800. So they're all right around the same level of power, really, not that much difference, okay? But Blue and o is technically the strongest out of all of them. Um, his preference is Tekai. He seems to use that most because he's a really, really large, he's sturdy as a bull, which I think is the reference there because he represents the bull with his uh, horns. He doesn't have the bull fruit. He, in fact, has a paramecia, the only member of Cypherpole that has a paramecia fruit rather than a zone, and it's the Doa Doa no Mi. Made a video about that already, if you want to go check out what that does. A little bit broken, but not really. Um, so, yeah, Blue Uno was taken out pretty early on in Annie's lobby. He was actually more prevalent during Water 7 and during that little sea train mini arc than anything, uh, because once he got to once he got to the uh, Annie's lobby, Luffy fought him pretty early on and defeated him before they even got into the Tower of Law, before they had to go up against the other members before they had to get the keys. Blue and o was already knocked on his uh, knocked on his face on top of the uh, courthouse. So yeah. However, Blue and o deserves some MVP status because he was the one that actually managed to get all the members of Cipher Pole out of the island before the Buster Call completely decimated the whole thing. The only reason that Lucci and all those members are alive right now is because of Blue and o, Because Blue and o woke back up at like the last minute, used his door powers, teleported, picked Picked up Luchi, teleported, picked up Fukuro, teleported, picked up Califal. All these people are knocked out. Kaku's knocked out. Picks them all up. Goes into that little air door pocket dimension space to protect them when it gets, like, bombed to oblivion. And then he emerges and he has everybody. He's, like, carrying everybody on his shoulders, okay? So, Blue and o, honestly, um, yeah, if, if he was a member of, like, the regular group that was in the Tower of Law and he got defeated just the normal way, like, like Fukuro did or Califa did, then he might have not have woken up in time and... 
you know, like the entire place would have just got bombed to, to crap and he would have been like underwater, right? So, yeah, uh, Blue No MVP. Um, he was also, uh, he didn't work for the Galila company at all when they uh, worked undercover at Water 7. Uh, he was actually a bartender at Blue No's bar. Makes sense, of course, if you play D&D, &D, the bartender is a perfect source for uh, information and for rumors. Um, do that, by the way, in case if, I mean, if you're a good DM, and I know I got some good DMs out there, you know, um, just come up with some lists of rumors, okay? And hopefully that your 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 PCs will come in and they'll actually ask the bartender, you got any crazy rumors about here? And just throw out a rumor. I love doing that. Um, Bluno, on top of just using his, um, his, his door powers, he uses his tech eye. All right, he used this against Luffy. He was kind of arrogant in thinking that his tech eye was, you know, like the strongest maybe out of all of the members of the CP9 because he seemed very proud of it. He had a special variation of tech eye called tech eye go or tech eye strong, all right? And so when he was fighting against Luffy, Luffy was beating the crap out of him with his jet skills, bouncing around all over the place, matching his Soru speed. And so finally, Luffy released his jet bazooka, boom, and, you know, he chose to take it. He's like, okay, I respect you as a warrior. I'll take your power right here with mine. Tech eye, go! And then boom, it hits him, and he slides back, and he almost falls off the damn roof, but he's there just holding his position and just like... <laughs> got another one in and then he just collapses and Luffy was about to break out gear third against him okay so Blue no you held up you were kind of tanky there um he took like a super powerful kick from Sanji I remember that scene during the sea train mini arc where Sanji goes right up next to Blue no he you know Sanji plants his hand on the ground and just spins like crazy fast and then Boom! Just slams right into the side of Bluno, and it doesn't break his tech eye, but the other members of the, like, the crew, like Lucci, they notice, like, ooh, he got really close to breaking his tech eye. Just barely. That was a really strong kick. So, yeah, you can see Bluno was definitely proud of his tech eye, as am I! Okay, next up is gonna be some tech eye training, some iron body action. Okay, now, this right here is called a, uh... Uh, laundry post thingy. It's what people used before dryers were invented, okay? This is solid iron, some kind of metal it's made out of. Okay, let's do this. <sighs> Alright, so now we're getting into some of the more high-powered members of the Cypher Pull. Alright, with a Doroki of 2,180, so you can notice that's a big gap there from 820 to 2180, we got Jabra, Jabra the werewolf, because he ate the wolf wolf or the Inu Inu no Mi model wolf uh, zone, all right, which uh, very similar to uh, Luchi's is a carnivorous zone, so he's a little bit more, you know, ravenous than the other zones are out there. I like Jabra, he also has a pet chicken, um, so yeah, he has the pet chicken, It's not, the chicken is not as well known as Luchi's uh, fateful pigeon companion, Hattori, of course, but he does have a pet chicken, so just throwing that out there, all right, so yeah. Jabra. Hmm, how to talk about this guy. All right, well, um, he's not that great with love life. I'll tell you that right now. He did not take Kumadori's advice. This is the saddest thing about Jabber. You want me to explain this to you? Oh, my God. So, he had a girlfriend named Gatherin, who is a beautiful pinup girl for the, you know, Ennie's lobby. She works in the cafeteria as a waitress, okay? So, all of the government employees just fawn over her constantly. Jabra and Gatherin were actually dating until Lucci came back to town after his mission, to which Gatherin immediately broke up with Jabra, and the way she broke up with Jabra was, I'm just so sorry, I love Lucci-san. Yeah, so you can understand why Jabra is not super fond of Lucci, or Kaku for that matter. Jabra was, I feel like, the strongest member before Lucci and Kaku went off to, you know, work on their undercover. They were gone for like four or five years or something like that, so they were gone for a long time. In that time, Jabra continued to do all sorts of assassination missions and everything, getting stronger and stronger and stronger, improving his Rokushiki and uh, his Devil Fruit powers and everything like that. So, by the time the other members got back, he was probably thinking, oh, I'm stronger than Kaku, I'm stronger than Lucci. These guys have been playing freaking, you know, Shipwright for the last five years. Not thinking that playing Shipwright probably would increase your physical stacks quite a bit. I mean, you gotta build ships for a living. You gotta be strong, right? So, turns out Kaku and Lucci are both stronger than Jabra, which he didn't take very well. So, he might have been the highest before Lucci and uh, Kaku trained more, right? 
So yeah, um, considering that he can turn into a wolf, pretty impressive. I don't think we actually get to see his full wolf form um, in the story. He mostly prefers his hybrid, like, werewolf form. He's got really sharp claws for that reason. Shigan and uh, Tekai, kind of a combination of the both, is what really he prefers to use in combat there. Um, you know, hardening up his body and then jabbing them with his Shigan is his go-to. Considering the fact, like Luchi, he has really sharp nails when he goes into his hybrid form, that just increases the lethality of uh, Shigon all the more, all right? Um, his fight with Sanji, one of my favorites in the entire story. Like, if I was going to make top 10 fights, like my personal top 10 fights, Luchi, uh, not Luchi, well, Luchi and Luffy would be on there, but also Jabber and Sanji would be on there because that was the fight where Sanji showed up his Diablo Jambe for the first time, burned right through his tech eye. That scene where Jabber is, like, beating Sanji down and he just starts spinning out of nowhere and he's like, what? What are you doing, spinning? Are you off your rocker? And then Sanji just kicks him and Jabra's like, holy crap, that's hot! And you feel the pain, because Jabra gets knocked into a sidewall, and he's just like, oh, oh, man, he's like on the ground thrashing. It's like, oh, I feel it all the way down to my bones. Like, tech, I did shit. It didn't do anything. So, yeah, you really feel that fight there, and the way that it ends with him just taking his, 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 his talons, his nails, and just jamming them right into freaking Sanji's body, and then Sanji just brings up the flamba shot, and just knocks him right into the ground. That was a beautiful fight, most of it taking place in the air. Oh my god, that was so cool. I love that. I love Jabra. I love the uh, back and forth that Jabra had with Kaku when he transformed into a giraffe. That was a one-up for Jabra, because Kaku's dorky is like... 20 points higher than Jabra's, but then he sees Kaku transform into a giraffe, and he starts laughing like, ha ha, oh, okay, I can't believe I was jealous of you there, Kaku. You turn into a freaking giraffe? I'm a wolf! I can literally turn into a werewolf! You, giraffe! Of course, we got to see in his fight with Zoro that giraffes are pretty badass. I mean, I already knew that, but in case you were on the fence, yeah, you don't mess with a giraffe on a good day or a bad day, or a do <laughs> definitely not on a bad day, right? Um... But yeah, like Jabra, and uh, hope to see more of him in the future. He's probably the one I'm most interested in seeing again, even more than Fukuro. I mean, Fukuro is fun, Kumidori is fun, but Jabra is just badass. He's a really strong fighter. I can't wait to see how he's improved over the years. And I hope to see his full wolf form, too, because I really don't think we got to see that form at all. That'd be really cool to see Jabra and his full wolf um, aesthetic, okay? So, uh, moving on now to finally, we got Kaku with a Doroki of 2200. Um, still way less than Luchi. Luchi had 4000, as we mentioned. I'm not going to cover Luchi too much. I, like I said, I did a whole video on Luchi if you want to go check that out. I'll, I'll talk about him a little bit, but beyond that, he, he's kind of like a principal antagonist in all of One Piece, and he's still around. So, I'd really recommend to go check out that Luchi video I made here, okay? Um, but yeah, okay, Kaku. So, he was born in the East. Interesting, because he's got the uh, square Usopp nose. Usopp was born in the East. Hmm, there's something going on there. I don't know. But anyway, um, he worked for Galilaw, and he actually enjoyed his job, like, quite a bit. He was one of the people that really did, it did suck when he got fired. You know, when Zoro defeated him, and he's like, uh, yeah, your boss told me you're fired. And Kaku's like, ugh, Polly, huh? Ah, that sucks. Because I feel like Kaku, like... He was on the fence about the assassin life, and he had to go back to it, because that's what he's been raised to do his whole life. Like, never get attached to anything. It's just a job. That was probably how he was raised his whole life. So, at the very end of it, though, he probably was thinking, well, maybe I could go back to Galila. Maybe I could continue my uh, my carpentry job. But no, it didn't really work out for him. Um, his specialty that he loved to use is his uh, Rangkyaku, his Tempest Kick techniques. Okay, we got to see that. He had his Yontoryu, which is his four-sword style. He used two swords, obviously, in his two hands, and then he used his legs to... Create create the Tempest Kicks to fire at Zoro, okay? So Ron Kyaku, that was definitely his specialty. Even after transforming into a giraffe, we saw how he could use that in a very deadly way, turning into a cube, shooting the uh, Tempest Kicks up in the air, hitting off the ceiling and raining back down, or using that centrifugal force to just spin his massive body and just, shing, slice the entire tower in half. So, very impressive ability there. We got to see Zoro busting out his Ashura for the first time to take down Kaku. Really love Kaku. And, um, yeah, his little gimmick his little thing that he does is that he's only like he was 23 two years ago he's 25 now but he talks in like the way an old timer would talk he'd be like you damn kids you know you whippersnappers what are you up to today so he's basically a prime target for the okay boomer thing so if we bring him back and he still talks like that then 
There you go. Memes aplenty, right? But yeah, Kaku is back. He's a member of Aegis Zero. We saw that during Reverie. He's there, and he's got his nose outstretched, ready to um, re ready to take action against uh, anybody that would dare threaten the Tenryu Bito. So yeah, really liking Kaku, and he's a fun guy, so I'd like to see him again. Though not as much as Jabra. I do like giraffes more than wolves, though, if I had to make a choice. Oh man, that is difficult. Yeah. And now, finally, we got the Rankyaku, or the Tempest Kick technique. Honestly... I couldn't think up of anything else to do with the Ronkyaku because the first time I did it, I think it was the best one, the best demonstration. So um, I'm just gonna cop out here and just show you the footage from when I did it the last time. Take it away, 2017 me. Now you can unscrew the cap here on the Gatorade. It was on there kind of tight. And now you are ready to perform. Ronkyaku! All right, let's try that again. Ronkyaku! Shit. All right, so finally we'll talk about Lucci a little bit, just in brief, because uh, there's a lot of stuff to unpack with Lucci here. Doraki of 4,000, way higher than all the other members by a country mile, almost double what Kaku's was, so don't mess with Lucci. Um, got the powers of the Leopard Zone, so it's carnivorous, very dangerous. He's mastered all the six powers, which of course awaken the greatest of the six powers. I am of course referring to the Roku Ogun! Yes, Roku Ogun, but I didn't really say it appropriately. You gotta really bring that diaphragm up when you say it. I think it's the diaphragm. I don't know, something about this. You gotta make it sound really deep, like you're in like a like a screamo band or something. Okay, so say it with me now, kids. Are you ready? All right, it's like a Kamehameha, except you just gotta give it more oomph. All right, ready? Here we go. Roku Ogun! Yes, indeed. His battle with Luffy is one of the greatest, like, high-octane battles in all of One Piece. I mean, they go at it, really. And it's like you feel that strife for Luffy to really win at the end. Because he's literally fighting against, like, this, this government-created uh, super soldier. You know, where he's going up against, like, the Terminator, kind of. Where it's like Luffy was raised his entire life to obey these orders and just take out any threat to the world government. Plus, he's got that innate bloodlust in him, too. Makes him an extremely dangerous opponent. Um, and he could turn into a leopard. So yeah, also just just keep stays like a shark with a missile launcher on top of a tank that can also fly. So very dangerous guy Luchi is, and you really feel that in their battle there. Um, but yeah, like I said, I made a whole video about Luchi. So if you want that whole thing in, in grand scope and what he's been up to and where he's at right now and all the things that happened in his past, go just check out the Luchi video. I'm linking to a lot of stuff in this video, but there's a lot of stuff to unpack here with Cypher Pole. I can't ca cover everything. This, al this video is already getting a little long here. Um, but finally, I just wanted to end it out here with this last uh, piece of information here. It was not revealed in the story, but uh, I have connections. I have connections to Oda and his editors and his people. And uh, this is canon information, and I'm trusting you guys a lot here, okay? So just bear with me. It was actually revealed by Oda himself that Hattori, Luchi's little pigeon companion, at the time of Eni's Lobby, so it's probably even higher right now, had a Doraki of 10,000. 10,000. It's probably a million right now, but we don't know about that. But yeah, so I'm just now you might be thinking, well, why didn't Hattori fight against Luffy? He's like, well, Hattori knew that his full power would just completely obliterate all of Eni's lobby and everything included. And Hattori, unlike Luchi, cares about his comrades a little more. He didn't want to completely, he would have to wipe out Luchi in the process. And that's like his best bud. He's not going to do that. But I'm telling you, if you get Luchi, I mean, if you get Luchi and Hattori separated, it's not Luchi you should be afraid of. It's Hattori, 162%, all right? So anyway, yeah, um, hope you guys enjoyed this video here. Uh, this is Secret Agent Teching. Uh, I'm going to be getting going, signing out, and uh, yeah, just keep practicing the Roku Shiki. I know it's hard to kind of grasp at first, but um, keep working at it, guys. Keep doing it. I know you can do it someday. I believe in you probably don't try to run into posts a lot, right? Uh, I'll leave you with a really bad pun. All right, I'll leave you with a bad pun. Here you go. It's it's a visual pun, so you have to look at it. Um, but uh, do you get it? Do, do you get it? I hope you get it. Okay, well, have a great night, everybody. Hats off. Teching, signing out.